clap our hands, open up our Bible study with worship. We're going to sing that song, Arise Away. Arise, awake, the Lord has come to meet his disciples in the air. Arise, awake, the Lord has come to gather his church from everywhere. And they that have died, they shall rise first. We who are alive shall follow to be with the Lord forevermore. He'll trade our joy. Arise, awake. Arise, awake, the Lord has come to meet his disciples in the air. Arise, awake, the Lord has come to gather his church from everywhere. And they that have died, they shall rise first. We who are alive shall follow to be with the Lord forevermore. He'll trade on one more time, arise, awake. Rise awake, the Lord has come to meet his disciples in the air. Arise awake, the Lord has come to gather his church from everywhere. And they that have died, they shall rise first. We who are alive shall follow to be with the Lord forevermore. He'll trade our joy for sorrow. Let's give praise to Jesus Christ. And we're going to slow it down this morning, continue to worship Jesus before Bible study. We're going to sing out that song, All in All. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in Seeking you as a precious jewel. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Give praise to Jesus Christ one more time. Um, and we're going to open up our Bible study, and I'm going to ask if Pastor Rob Sanchez was, would open us up in uh, prayer. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to, uh, I want to say finish, but I may get inspired to do one more study. But we've been doing, looking at the church at the end of the world, and we really started it with the three-part video series on the emergent church. Uh, last week uh, or two weeks ago, we showed an oldie but a goodie on uh, the Catholic church. Uh, how many people know that's part of the last day's church apostasy right there? Uh, I, I'm meeting more and more Catholics are telling me they're trusting Jesus, which is great. But they won't condemn certain things like the prayers to Mary and purgatory. And if you're not going to condemn those false teachings, you're still not right with God. So uh, I think it's great that uh, especially some of my relatives and friends are telling me, oh, yeah, I'm praying to Jesus. I don't pray to, you know, the saints. But you won't condemn the doctrines. <clears throat> uh, you know, you're still not delivered from the, f the false teaching. And so last week uh, or last time we looked at the church at Laodicea, we're going to look at some prophetic teaching that Jesus did. There's a couple of portions of Scripture 
where Jesus specifically, Paul also does this, but they give prophecies about the church. And some of these prophecies are unflattering. There are some good ones. But some of them are very obscure. People don't really like them, and they don't really understand them, and they kind of misunderstand these teachings because they don't like what they really imply. And uh, maybe your, your mind will be a little blown when you see it. I need someone to get Luke 18, 7 to 8 for me. Uh, I'm going to ask my brother Austin to read that. Let's do a quick review of our foundational text in the last study so we can reinforce some learning here. Go ahead. Okay, will he really find faith in the earth? They're looking at the church in prophecy today. Uh, what does Jesus mean by the question at the end of this uh, portion of scripture we, uh, Austin just read? What does he mean by it? What's he asking about here? He says, will the church really have faith? Will, will Christ find faith when he comes back? What does he mean by that? What's he doing with that question, Kim? He's implying that not many people will be faithful. Anyone want to add to that, uh, Gage? Yeah, they'll put their trust in other things, which is basically idolatry, even though we know people aren't necessarily bowing down to statues today. Uh, <clears throat> what do you see happening in the church that makes you think of this verse? Uh, Gage? Gage? A lot of Christian psychology being preached. That's true. Um, I find very little scriptures in the New Testament about uh, God's job is to make you happy. The word self-affirmation is actually a blasphemy against dying to self, which is actually the Christian doctrine. Uh, one of the biggest false teachings I ever hear from people is you have to love yourself before you can love your neighbor as yourself. And I say, well, you don't have to try real hard to love yourself. <laughs> I guarantee nobody woke up this morning and did things purposely to hurt themselves. Right? There might be a secret cutter here. If we have teenagers here, I would think maybe. But amongst the average uh, healthy, normal adult, that's not the case. We are very <laughs> we're easily in love with ourselves. Uh, anybody look in the mirror today? And you wanted to make sure you looked fantastic, right? <laughs> Gage? That's true. That's, not, that's, that's good. Uh, what does it mean that people ought not to lose heart? Because he's actually getting at a specific thing that people won't be doing in the last days. They're going to lose heart. Uh, Kim? They'll give up. They'll quit Christianity. And it usually starts when they quit praying. Can, can I get an amen? Because we know the context of Luke 18 is persistent prayer. And I actually got a sermon on that today as well. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, we really got to uh, think, think this through about, uh, about spending more personal time in prayer as a church. Okay, you can't just wait for the monthly prayer meeting. Uh, what is the city slash church in Revelation, whose Greek name means justice of the people in English. What, what church had that name? Nobody else was here but Gage. Eric? Laodicea, exactly. Literally means justice of the people, although technically that really means like rule by the people. In other words, people make the rules. Uh, what was that church like? What was their attitude? What were they like? Uh, Eric? Lukewarm and indifferent. So the motto of a pure democracy is whatever you want. Whatever most people can agree to, right? You can all get along. Tolerance. So that allows for a certain amount of Christianity to be tolerated. But what kind of Christianity tends to be tolerated? What type tends to be tolerated? 
You know, they had churches in communist uh, Russia, right? They still have churches in communist China. What kind of churches are tolerated? Gage? Compromise. Neither hot nor cold. Lukewarm. Right? So this is the problem with Laodicea. And this is the problem with America, with Canada. Uh, we have more religion than we have Christianity. We have more Christian religion than we have true believers. And it comes down to this. Uh, in a place ruled by the people... They'll accommodate anybody's religion. You can worship a cabbage. But in the, in the mind of the politicians and the population, all religions are the same. But that's not biblically true. Uh, I have no problem with theocracy or, or you know, I don't, I don't, show me in the history books where having a king is worse than having a president. If you could show me that, I'll change my opinion and I'll, I'll preached how Pastor Moynihan was wrong about something. But, the, but actually, if you study history, uh, except for the checks and balances in our government that prevent tyranny, uh, there's plenty of dictators that, had, that were elected to office. Right? Hugo Chavez in Venezuela was elected to office. Adolf Hitler, Nazi Germany, elected to office. The Soviet Union had election every two years. You could vote. And amazingly enough, the communist candidate always won. Of course, he was the only candidate, but the point is, uh, now he got 99.9% .9 of the vote. All right? And then that 0.01%, those people uh, are dead. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't give me this, oh, democracy, it's the only way that people, the will of the people will be established. Uh, maybe we don't want the will of the people. Maybe the will of the people is dangerous. Uh, what happens to a church when the people rule? What happens to a church when a church gets that way? Is that Will back there? Go ahead, Will. Yeah, they quickly lose sight of God and what God's vision is. That's why you have to have a pastor. You can't have... You have to have one authority who's communicating with God. And let me tell you why it's better to have one leader in charge that has autonomy. Because everyone can watch him. Right? If I'm in charge and I make all the rules, I have, let's see, today, how many people are in this Bible study? About 40? I have 40 people checking me to make sure. I don't preach false doctrine. I'm not immoral. I'm not unethical. And if I am, you can get rid of me, right? Pastor Rob, Kyle, Gage, we got the church council here. Let's have a little meeting. Have a talk about what was pastor preaching about today. We all got to wear white sheets and sit up on the roof on, during a Sabbath service. Right? But what if we let you guys all make the rules? Who's checking it? Nobody. And the pastor can't sit there and go, hey, we can't do that. Hey, we can't do it because he's not charged no more. Can you see why it's more righteous to have one leader who has total authority? Because we're still a church. You can still get rid of your leader if he's a false teacher. But if he's not, why would you want to get rid of him? If he's hearing from God, why would you ever want to rebel or get rid of a pastor who's hearing from God? How do you know he's hearing from God? You got this book. Right. If I walk in here with the, uh, you know, like John uh, Smith did when he started the Mormon church, if I walk in here with the, uh, the book of Timothy. <laughs> right. Or the book of Mormon, uh, not Mormon, Moynihan. <laughs> you got a problem. You have a right to say that doesn't line up with this pastor. You're done. We're calling Greg Mitchell. We're calling Joe Rice. We're calling Dan Jones. We're calling Joe Zebo. We're getting rid of you. And they'll remove me quickly. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting how we always get this backwards? Let the people decide. And all of a sudden you have a golden calf and people are taking off their clothes and dancing in the name of the Lord. Right? Uh, and this started at the Tower of Babel where the people rule. 
resulted in a dictatorship, a tyranny of wickedness. And the motivation at the Tower of Babel was, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's make ourselves famous. Very American. Uh, how, is it, uh, how is that like popular churches, mega churches, or emergent churches of today? These are churches that traffic in big crowds. Again, not, nothing wrong with having a big church. Uh, you know, I would like to be a lot bigger than this. But Karina? Yeah, they have that, that lukewarm doctrine. They want everybody to come, and you don't have to change to be at our church, not like that dirty, nasty potter's house. Right? They ought to call it the hater's house. Well, heaven's a ha full of haters and people that hate sin. You better get used to that. Uh, what does it mean to be an overcomer? Will? Yeah, it's basically you're not going to give in to the peer pressure of the world. You're someone who's going to resist the pressure that the world, the flesh, and the devil, as we heard well used that phrase on Saturday morning by Pastor Payne. Uh, and the three-part solution for that church, who remembers what it was for the Laodicean church? It was the three-part solution. I quoted the verse where the three parts are. Can anyone find them and explain them? What does it mean by buy of me gold tried in the fire? What does it mean to be tried in the fire? What does that phrase mean, Omar? Exactly. Tested by tribulation and temptation. You emerged out of it solid for Jesus. They persecuted you, you shook it off. They tried to flood you with pornography and temptation and try to get you to go to the beach on Sunday instead of church, and you said, heck no. Right? <clears throat> uh, what's the next one? Uh, white raiment. What does that mean? What's white raiment in the Bible, Gage? Exactly, the righteousness of Christ, clothed in God's righteousness. Finally, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that, they, that thou mayest see. What's the problem with this church? What, what did they lack? What kind of vision are we talking about here? Uh, Rob? They lack a vision for the church. That's good. What else? How about discernment? How about they can't see themselves the way they really are? They can't see the plank in their neighbor's eye because they have a, a much bigger plank in their own eye. So they can't remove somebody else's plank because theirs is in the way. These are all examples of how this idea of vision and being able to see is used in the Bible. All right, let's move on to the church in prophecy. We're going to look at Prophetic texts, and we've got a lot of like proof texts here, so I hope we get through this today. But let's try to move it along. First Timothy 4, 1 to 5, Will, Luke 18, 7 to 8, Luke, uh, Matthew 13, 24 to 30, Ricky, Luke 13, 18 to 19, Kyle, Matthew th uh, or Daniel 4, 19 to 22, Eric. Ezekiel 31, 2 to 6, Josh, 10 to 13, Omar, Matthew 13, 3 to 4, and also read verse 19, uh, Fernando, Matthew 12, 43 to 45, Natalie, Luke 13, 20 to 21, will be uh, John, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, Sue, Leviticus 6, 15 to 17, Gage, Exodus 12, 15, uh, Jack, can you read that? Can you help your son out there, Kyle, with that one, Exodus 12, 15? I hope it's not a long one. It's probably about adultery or something. 
I always pick those ones for the kids, but I'm not planning to. Acts 2, 16 to 21, Jonathan, John 14, 12, Natalie, Matthew 24, 14, uh, Kim, Matthew 13, 47 to 51, Ricky, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, John. All right, so let's get through these together. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, the church in prophecy. All right, is this about the church? Is this about the church? Uh, Fernando, yeah, yes, exactly. It's absolutely about the church. Anyone here raised Catholic? Does that sound familiar from the Catholic teachings, what's mentioned there, that are for, uh, that are, uh, God is calling blasphemy? Forbidding certain foods, forbidding to marry. That's the, your celibate priesthood and celibate nuns and monks. Uh, they actually have a doctrine in the Catholic Church that a, a holy marriage, the married couple abstains from sex. And to me, that is wicked. That is, talk about promoting perversion. And this is why in some cultures, no offense if you're Mexican, but you people, uh, it's totally acceptable for a wealthy man to have a mistress. They don't hide it. There's no shame. Businessmen all over Mexico that have a certain amount of money, uh, you know, they have, a, they have a, a, a mistress with two or three kids, and they have their wife with two or three kids. And that's part of their Catholic school teaching, uh, their Catholic uh, church idea, because marriage, sexuality is perverted in their marriages. Uh, it's supposed to be the opposite. Celibate people, you know, people who are not married are not supposed to be having sex. And people who are married are supposed to be having a lot of sex. So if you have a problem with that, read your Bible and, and show me where I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> show me where I'm wrong. <laughs> you, you, you do know when uh, the Philistine king realized that Abraham and Sarah was married when he saw them sporting with each other. You figure out what that means. They weren't playing volleyball. That, that, that would not be an indicator that they were married. <laughs> he meant they were flirting with each other uh, and touching each other. Okay? It doesn't mean they were doing anything indecent in front of people, but they were doing what people do all the time who are uh, married, who love each other. And so this is uh, forbidding foods. What's, what's getting even weirder is secular cultures doing this now. The whole vegan thing. The vegan thing is based on a spiritual lie. It's not based on health. I would tell you, there's no such thing as a healthy vegan. If you want to have a pull-up contest with me, find a vegan, push-up contest, a, a wrestling match. I don't care if you're 22 years old. If you're a vegan, you are a weak, insipid man. Well, I'm just a vegetarian. <laughs> That's a vegan who eats chicken. That's okay with me. I have no problem with that. I've been a vegetarian before. So I was eating fish and chicken, and uh, my wife still mocks me because the first time I, she came over to my house, I had tofu. But, of course, we learn now that soy is no good for, for uh, men, so we don't do soy no more. Right, I'll make you weak. Uh, Karina? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not, we're not, Karina and I are not saying McDonald's cheeseburgers three times a day are good for you. What we're saying is uh, veganism is a lie from hell. 
and it's usually based on a spiritual idea. They think they're being kinder to animals. And uh, the joke in my house is, what about the cry of the broccoli? Right? Salad, salad is slaughter. Right? <laughs> that's, that's what we say at my house. But this is becoming very popular in the world, and they're promoting the idea even now of meat that's made from uh, something that they grow in tubes. Uh, but the point is, this is a religious idea. It started in the Catholic Church, the Hindu religion, the Buddhist religion, uh, certain forms of Islam, like uh, what do they call the, um, I can't remember the name of it, but the, it's the Sufis, I think, the, the people that are the mystics of Islam believe this. It's nonsense. It's a religious idea that's popular in the last days, but it will divert you from true spirituality. That's the point. If you think you're being spiritual because of these things, you're not. You're not. Uh, it may surprise you to know the Bible, specifically Jesus' teaching in the gospel, gives several unflattering prophecies about the future of the church. Read and consider the meaning of these words from Jesus Christ. Begin by re reminding yourself of Luke 18, 7 to 8. Go ahead and read that, whoever I gave that to. Amen. So just a reminder, the, the theme verse of this is an indictment against the church. That when Christ comes back at the rapture, will there be enough faith for people to even be raptured? Uh, you can read my, get my sermon on, uh, you know, having your go bag ready. I don't believe this uh, thing that everyone, uh, for some reason, even in our fellowship, people are like Calvinists about the rapture. We're like, you're not really saved unless you go to church and live for God and outreach and all that. And then the next minute, they're like, well, you know when the rapture comes, 75% uh, of Americans are going to go. Because 75% of Americans say they believe in Jesus. No, actually, when the rapture comes, no one will notice in most churches. Because there isn't enough faith in most churches to rapture uh, a snail. Hello. And so we're talking about a real problem in the church age that Jesus warned us about. If, is the church to be filled with hypocrites? Is the church to be filled with hypocrites, yes or no? Yes, it is, because Jesus said so. Jesus made it clear. I love it when people say the church is filled with hypocrites. I say yes, which makes you prime material to be a member Jesus taught this doctrine that the church in the last days would be filled with hypocrites and there's nothing you can do about it. You have to let them in. You say, really? Really? Because you can't tell who's a real Christian and who's not if they appear to bear the fruits of Christianity. It's called tares and wheat. They look identical. They, only God knows. And so, yeah, great. If somebody's committing adultery, kick them out of the church. Uh, that's bad fruit right there. But if they're not, but they're kind of lukewarm or they're just, you're not sure, what are you going to say? Well, you didn't go on outreach, so you must be back, so you're out of here. You can't do that to people. So look what Jesus says about this in uh, Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Listen. All right, 
So what does it say we're to do about the hypocrites in the church? It says nothing. Because what happens if you try to clean out the tares? What happens? You're going to get rid of some good folks. Because your judgment is really whacked. I know we're supposed to have discernment. We're supposed to measure people by their fruit. And obviously, it's easy to fake good fruit. Uh, I remember this guy in my church. He was Mr. Hyperspiritual. And he was complaining because some old lady in my church wasn't going on the outreaches. So I, how can someone like that really be saved, Pastor? And I go, you don't know what you're talking about. That woman is 80-something years old. And do you know that she witnesses to people in the old folks' home? And, you know, I severely rebuked this brother. Well, 10 years later, he went to jail for being a murderer, and, and she went to glory in heaven. Praise the Lord. And so uh, there's a difference, and you can't tell what it is. If you, if you come around to me and you start pointing out hypocrites in the church, I'm going to be wondering what's going on in your life that you're, <laughs> you feel the need to do this, brother. Oh, the Lord's given me the power to discern between the wheat and the tares. I'm going to start a church called Church Without Tares Christian Fellowship. If you're not in my church, you probably aren't right with God. <laughs> Can't do it. And I wish, you know, we had that much discernment. I wish there was a way to really tell. But you can't. And so, uh, obviously, there's obvious bad fruit and obvious good fruit. Even if a wheat has bad fruit, you got to rebuke him. So I know that brother's saved, but he needs to quit smoking. I know that brother just gave his life to Christ last week. He's on fire. He's been inviting people to church. But he can't outreach with a hooter shirt on. I am sorry. <laughs> He's got to get rid of that thing, man. Someone load that guy a T-shirt. <laughs> right? But other people, man, they'll give. They'll do everything right. But they're really not saved. It's just a religious tradition or conviction or whatever. And you can't figure out, all, all, always sort those people out. Uh, Luke 13, 18 and 19. This one's interesting because you really need to think this one through. All right, what do you think this means? Is that, you think that's a good or a bad thing about the church? Do you have any idea what it means? Well, obviously, you've read it a hundred times, so you must know what it means or have thought something about it, right? Because you're not one of those people that reads the Bible and doesn't, you know, and just pretends they know what it means, but you really don't even know what you just read. You're not one of those people, are you? Ter? I mean, uh, Christian? <laughs> Participation, people. You, you do get a participation crown in heaven. It's called eternal life. Uh, Eric, uh, Austin? Um, I know, I know uh, in the Bible it talks about the That's great. That is exactly right. And so what does a mustard seed produce? Does it produce a mustard tree? There's no such thing as a mustard tree. A mustard plant is a bush. So why is he saying it turns into a tree here? What does that indicate? Unnatural growth. Saying the church is going to grow in a way it wasn't designed to grow. It's going to grow into something it was never meant to be. And if you say, I don't, I don't understand what that means. Explain why there are spires on churches why do you have a symbol of the Tower of Babel on your church? Uh, Ricky? Exactly. You just described the Vatican. Right? You described the Vatican. You described uh, the headquarters at Saddleback Church. 
right, where that man who calls himself a, a Baptist preacher, Rick Warren, is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, fellowships with Muslims, says we're out worshiping the same God, complete false teacher. Right? You just described the Mormon church and its head prophet. And a lot of churches have crazy stuff going on in them. Some of you have been around the church world a little bit. You've seen some crazy stuff. I've seen crazy stuff in the fellowship. <laughs> Hello. Not our perfect fellowship without tares. Now we got a few, and some of them have the word pastor in front of their name. All right? I'm not, again, I can't say who those people are. I'm not judging anybody. I'm not calling out anybody. I'm just saying you don't really know sometimes. Until something goes wrong, and then you're like, what was going on there? Pastor, uh, uh, was it Pastor Olson or Pastor Payne? One of them made a joke about how there's always these people that say, I knew that guy was uh, a rebel when some pastor leads a fellowship. It's like, well, if you had that much discernment, why didn't you tell the rest of us before it happened? <laughs> you really don't know. People surprise you, man. Uh, they really do surprise you. Uh Let's go get to Austin's great point about the birds, because we've seen this in other scriptures. That's exactly right. So here's a couple examples. Go ahead, Daniel 4, 19 to 22. Did I give that to anyone? So this is describing Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar's rule. So Jesus is saying the church is going to be like Babylon. And the Jews would have known that. They would have recognized that term that Jesus used. It's used also to describe the apostasy. I think this is of the Assyrians or the Pharaoh or somebody. In Ezekiel 31, go ahead and read those. Again, these are a little bit obscure. But I just want to show you that this image is used in other places in the Bible. Ezekiel 31, 2 to 6, and then 10 to 13, whoever I gave those to.
Oh, so there's the church, Jesus comparing it to Egypt and Assyria, too. <laughs> so this is a pretty frightening. Every, every Jewish listener to Jesus would have known these verses in Ezekiel and Daniel. These are part of the Jewish scriptures. So Jesus is reaching back. There's also another story Jesus uses to describe the, uh, these birds and their demonic nature that uh, Austin referred to. Matthew 13, 3 to 4, and then verse 19. All right, so right there, the bird is being compared to the devil, demons. So again, this is a prophecy of unnatural growth. And because of the unnatural uh, nature of this growth, uh, it will become a refuge for demonic spirits, false teachings. And again, this brings us back to 1 Timothy 4, what we read in words 1 to 5 there, right? So there's this correlation that Jesus is making. And, you know, you probably heard very few sermons on Matthew 13, I mean, on uh, Luke 13, 18 to 19. Because most churches aren't, don't like this idea that uh, they think growth is great. The faster you grow, the more God's in it. Well, you need to read the history of churches that grow fast and find out what they did to produce unnatural growth. We saw it in the history of the Catholic Church, the history of the Mormon Church, the history of false religions like Jehovah Witnesses, and we see it in the history of the emergent church. You saw the videos, and I don't need to go into any more detail on that. Uh, <clears throat> so think about these slighty, unclean things that come and go, and they find refuge in people and things, and they're demons. And Jesus warned uh, the church about this. Will, do you want to add something? No, no, you, you can't, you gotta, you gotta look at the context, okay? Whenever birds are used symbolically, they represent that, right? It doesn't mean that every bird is evil, right? Certain birds are used symbolically. They're symbols in prophecy. Uh, and often they'll specifically use an unclean bird. Like, they use an, like the first bird that Noah sent out was an unclean bird. It was a raven, right? So that shows you some some. Birds are bad and some are good. And, but the point is, is that's a literal story. Right? So that one is, doesn't work because he's not using, a story isn't meant to be symbolic, even though people pretend it is. Uh, but that's a good question because, you know, it's, people get confused by that. Uh, Austin? Yeah, that's like, a, yeah, and that's a clean bird, right? And so, and it said like a dove. It's just symbolic. It just look, appeared to be like a bird. It wasn't a literal bird like all these posters that you see. Holy Spirit. <laughs> and they show this white bird, <coughs> right, right before it gets shot by a shotgun. I believe in hunting doves. <coughs> Anyways, moving on. Thank you, Pastor. Go back to the part on veganism. Uh, Matthew 12, 43 to 45. So just to make a correlation here, number one, this is also a prophecy about future believers, but uh, it's a principle that's still true. But it, also you get the sensing that these spirits, these unclean spirits, like fly around from place to place like a bird looking for a place to find refuge. God forbid it's your home or your church or your own soul, right? That's the thought here. 
<clears throat> and so all these scriptures inform us about the meaning of Luke 13, 18 to 19. We don't have to discuss that anymore. Let's go to the next one because we're almost out of time, and I think we can finish if we go quick. Same thought, Luke 13, 20 to 21. All right, he's saying the church is like a, a, a piece of bread with leaven in it. What does that mean? What does leaven produce in the bread? Uh, Gage? Right. Leaven is corruption. It's bacteria, right? And so you're putting bacteria in your bread or mold or I don't know what it is exactly. Someone probably here knows. But you're putting something in there. It's going to grow. Like my, my wife makes uh, yogurt, right? She makes it homemade. She takes just a little dash of bacteria from a previous yogurt, puts it in the thing with some special milk that she gets, and that bacteria grows like crazy, and I eat it. But don't be looking at me like that. Some of you eat cheese. That's bad milk. Right, especially blue cheese, bad milk with, with mold on it. it. Tastes great, though. <laughs> right? And you like bread. You like that fluffy bread. Tastes a lot better than uh, flat bread. Right? So there you go. That's a, uh, something that's a bacteria. It's unclean. And it makes bread, which if you didn't put that yeast in there, it would be flat bread. It'd be nothing but tortillas, man. But you put that in there, and that tortilla goes whoomph. And it grows like crazy. You don't have to put very much. Stuff grows, man. But it's unclean. It's an unnatural growth. Again, it's this idea that some unnatural, unclean things will get into the church and cause unnatural growth. Uh, again, let's look at some scriptures, and then we'll move on from this, just to prove the point. So go ahead and read these next three, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, and then Leviticus and Exodus. Go ahead, nice and fast. And that's my proof text of why Mexican food is in heaven, because... <laughs> The bread is unleavened. It's tortillas. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt again? Okay, Leviticus 6, 15 to 17. And then Exodus twelve fifteen. Right, so there you go. Leaven is always treated as something unclean in the Jewish culture. So Jesus didn't change that symbology and say, well, the church is okay to be leavened. No, he's saying the leaven's going to come in, the church is going to grow, the kingdom of God is going to grow crazy. But it isn't my methods, it isn't my holiness that's doing it. It's something unclean that's gotten into the mix. Uh <clears throat> There are some good things prophesied about the church. It's not all bad, obviously. But again, these are things we often don't think of the church as being the, the subject of prophecy in the Bible. 
Always focused on Israel, which we need to be. But you need to understand the role of the church in prophecy. Uh, let's look at a couple of scriptures real quick. Uh, Acts 2, John 14, and Matthew 24, 14. These are good prophecies about the church. John 14, 12. And then Matthew 24, 14. All right, so good news. There's good things, obviously, in the church. It's not all bad. Of course not. This is, the church was Jesus' invention. We just have to be aware of some of the things that are going to happen in the church. Nonetheless, when Christ returns, much of the church will not be prepared. Matthew 13, 47 to 51. All right, so Jesus is saying right there, there's going to be some good fish and some bad fish in the church. And only the angels are going to come and sort that out. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so we must prepare ourselves for Christ's imminent return for his church because he is looking for that invisible church of believers that are not tares, they're not bad fish, they're not infected by the yeast of corruption. And, uh, and this is... Uh, caught in this scripture, this is a text on marriage, but nonetheless, a parallel is made to the church and Christ coming for his bride. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. All right, very good. Any questions, comments, or thoughts before we close? Kyle? Yep. Exactly. Yeah, and, and let's face it, in the ancient times, it would have been very difficult to be a church hopper because there were so few churches. And now there's so many, and they're filled with so many uncommitted people that it's easy to be a church hopper. And let's face it, you know people that left this church, and they immediately announced, I'm going to this church. Well, you can probably guess that the church they're going to is filled with people that are church hoppers that have left other churches. So birds of a feather, to use a illustration that we talked about flock together exactly exactly 
Exactly. Amen. Excellent point. Do you want to add something, Rob? Yep, and there's a pattern there because as the, the, there's a growth in momentum, there's a momentum that comes with growth. As that is taking place, pastors become reluct reluctant to, to throw a monkey wrench in the works because they're like, man, this is great, man, you know. Uh, and so how do you throw a monkey wrench in? Well, you start asking people hard questions like, are you guys living together or are you married? And uh, that came up in the uh, Pioneer Rally, by the way. Uh, because even in our fellowship today, there's a, a strong temptation to just look the other way. Well, again, if someone's a new convert, let them be really a new convert. Like, they got saved last week and they're still living together. Not they got saved two years ago and they're, they're in the church living together. And, uh, you know, I would say you, you need to find out as quick as you can, especially if people are popular or they're starting to bring people in with them. Because they'll destroy your church. So, uh, you know, that's just the reality of it. And, you know, some people are just afraid to bring it up with the pastor, but you can't. You got you to, it has to be dealt with. All right. Uh, very good. Any other questions or comments? I hope the study was helpful. We're going to go ahead and uh, stop now and start service in five minutes. Uh, a lot of people waiting to come in, so don't cover your chair with personal items. Make some room for your neighbor. Um, just so you know, my wife and I are hitting the road right after service. Charlie Foreman will be here tonight. Praise God.